First of all, thank you, Dr. Sousa, for accepting my invitation to discuss the science of teaching and learning. It is an honor to be with you here today discussing education in neuroscience. You have authored one of the best uh, selling and notable books titled How the Brain Learns. And you have just recently published the sixth edition. Can you tell us uh, more about it? Well, um, we try to update this book uh, every five years, uh, mainly because it's used in universities and, and professional development programs. And the idea is to bring them the latest research that we have, because the research field is constantly growing. The findings from the research is con uh, are constantly growing. And so we want to update the book to bring the latest findings. Uh, the sixth edition has more information about social emotional learning, mm -hmm. uh, a little more information about uh, and cautions about mindset, the Carol, the work of Carol Dweck. Yes. Um, also, it has more information about the effects of technology on the brain. A book I wrote a few years ago was called Engaging the Rewired Brain, because what we're finding is that technology is, in fact, rewiring the human brain in, in several ways. And the students are relying so much on these things that it's, it's having an effect on how their brain grows and develops. Uh, so that's a, a major part of the changes that were made in the sixth edition. Very good. So um, uh, let's start with a quote of yours that struck me um, in your book. Um, Teachers are brain changes and knowing more about how the brain learns can only make you more successful at reaching and engaging young minds. Why is it so crucial for educators and parents to know um, some basic brain facts um, and be aware of the brain area functions? Sure. Well, teachers are brain changers. I mean, too often uh, when people ask what do they do, they say, I'm a teacher, and that's the end of it. If they started by saying, I'm a brain changer, that would be a much more interesting conversation. Because if the teacher has effectively presented the uh, learning episode of the day, the learning objective of the day, and the students understand it, make sense and meaning of it, and then decide to store that in long-term memory, they have changed that brain. They've changed it anatomically, they've changed it neurologically, so that um, it can be stored into long-term memory. So we are, from that standpoint, we are brain changers. And therefore, if you're trying to change the brain, it makes sense to me, the more you know about how that brain works, the better you're going to be, more effective, more successful you're going to be at changing it. Exactly. Yes, I believe. As simple that. as that. Yes. So in your book, um, How the Brain Learns, you talk about the window of op opportunity. Can you um, elaborate on this? What happens if we do not give our children this window of opportunity? The window of opportunity research simply says that there are times in the growth and development of the brain where certain capabilities are acquired more easily than at other times. Remember that these genetic um, predispositions were put in place many thousands of years ago when we didn't live to be very long. And so uh, they had to be put in place quite early. Remember too that the brain has the ability to constantly change itself as a result of its environment. Uh, many years ago, uh, I'm sure people who teach know about the nature versus nurture yes. balance. Nature is what your genes give you, nurture is what your environment gives you. And um, when I went to school many years ago, uh, the emphasis was on nature. The genes were pretty much determinate and that's, that's the way it is. Uh, we've discovered now, of course, uh, that that's not true. Certainly, the genetic predispositions have uh, have a make, uh, have great a, influence. Yeah, but the environment is much more powerful in shaping the brain. And so, uh, the environment that the, that the brain grows into will determine what capabilities it will take on. Now, we know, for example, that uh, spoken language is considered a survival skill by the brain. So we begin to acquire spoken language very quickly. Usually after about eight months of age, we're already our brain is already beginning to separate the sounds of language from background noise. Um, we begin to develop social skills uh, around the age of two to three, and uh, that comes into play pretty quickly. Emotional skills take longer, 
they start around the age of five or six and go uh, and mature around the age of 10 to 12. Uh, so there are different times when the brain is more receptive. Back to spoken language, uh, the two areas of the brain responsible for spoken language uh, are at their most active in the early years, between the ages of eight months and five, six years of age, depending on the individual. Um, after that, it becomes more difficult to acquire language, a language. second language, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, so these windows of opportunity simply point out that if, for example, with language, if you want to teach a second language as you do in Malta, um, you want to get it in early, the same time as you're teaching uh, the other language. In fact, teaching both languages at the same time is we have found is the best way to do it at an early age, because at that point, the brain is so plastic that it's able to separate out the two languages successfully and much more successfully than if you teach the second language many years, many years later. So we don't want the windows of opportunity to be seen as, as closing ever, um, but there are times it, it appears that the more we can do at an early age, the better. Okay, so the brain is a novelty seeker. Why is yeah. this so? Well, what's the brain's main job? The brain's main job is to keep you alive. That's its number one job. And it does that by constantly monitoring its environment to make sure that there are no threats out there. Now, your environment is often repetitive day after day after day. But, and so the brain gets used to that. But if something unexpected, novelty means something unexpected. And if something unexpected happens, like a siren goes off or a blast sound goes off, the brain immediately turns its attention to that because that's new, that's unexpected. That is novelty. And it gets its attention because it has to assess whether that sound it heard or flash of light can be a threat to you. And if so, what are we gonna do about it? So we can take advantage of that in teaching by saying, if we do novel things in the classroom, things that kids don't always expect, we have a greater chance of getting their attention. And one of the things we discovered in, uh, as a result of these, uh, devices is that our ability to focus is changing and attention is very critical to learning. So novelty in the classroom means doing something the students didn't expect when you introduce a, uh, a topic. Because remember, after a week or two or three of the school year, those students already know what to expect when they cross the threshold into your classroom because 99% of what you're gonna do is gonna be pretty much what you did the day before. Exactly. The content may be different, but the approach, your behavior, exactly. your sequence, how you do it, the kids already know. So there's very little novelty. And so they come in there already knowing, and when you already know what's gonna happen, it's like knowing the, the ending of a movie. When you know the ending, it kind of spoils everything else. Because you know how it's going to end. You, yes. you don't pay much attention to the rest of it. So the same thing in the classroom. If they pretty much know what's going to happen, it's tough to get their attention, especially when they have other things that are more interesting and exactly. novel. Mm -hmm. So the name of the game is trying to find different ways to increase your bag of tricks. It doesn't have to be a three-ring circus. You don't have to be a stand-up comedian. But what you have to do is recognize that uh, whenever I can introduce something differently from what they expect, I'm, I have a greater chance of getting their attention. They'll be, oh, where did that come from? Oh, she's never done that before. He didn't do that before. And then, students, students would remember that. They certainly they will. Still, they will remember it. In recent years, children have been growing up in a different environment, as we have just mentioned due to technology. Are schools changing fast enough in adopting instruction and strategies more likely to succeed with today's children? You partially um, um, replied this in your previous, in the previous yeah. question. Um, by nature, schools change slowly um, because the system has so many people running it, um, some of whom don't know anything about education, but they have policy, they make policy decisions. Uh, 
Because of that, it takes a lot of time to make substantial change. And I'm talking about real um, change in the way the system operates. Now, some will say that's good because you don't want schools knee-jerking reaction to everything that comes along. And so, oh, this is the answer. This is the, uh, this is the magic bullet we've been looking for. And by the way, that's true of educational neuroscience too. It's not a magic bullet. What it is, is a recognition that we're learning more and more about the human brain and how it learns. And the more we learn about it, the more successful we can be at teaching it. So from one standpoint, changing slowly has some positive aspects, but that doesn't mean no change. It means that when a change can make a material difference in the success of students, which after all is what schools are all about, then they're worth considering. And part of the resistance, by the way, Erica, to educational neuroscience is because teachers have become cynical about educational changes. Because if change comes down the path, they introduce it, they say, here is cooperative learning. Uh, and they say, we're going to train everybody in cooperative learning. And then they drop it and they move on to the next thing. Uh, now we've got uh, teacher expectations of student achievement. Let's talk about that. Now we've got reading recovery. Yes. Now we've got different ways. And the teachers just say, wait a minute, you know, I'll just wait it out because if I wait long enough, it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And it does. And so when you say we're going to talk about educational new science, some of them teachers say, oh, no, not another one of those things. It's not a program, though. It's not a program. It's a recognition of your profession. It's saying, wait a minute, if you're a teacher, you are a professional. And the, the, the responsibility of a professional is to always update their knowledge base so that they can be more uh, effective with their clients. In this case, case, the clients being students. I mean, would you want to go to a doctor, a physician who's still working from the medicine of 1980s? I wouldn't. Now, there may be a couple of things from 1980s medicine that are still worth doing, but we've come a long way since then. And there are many more modern uh, strategies in medicine mod that uh, can be much more effective than they used to be 10, 15 years ago. Same thing with teaching. We're learning more about the, how the brain learns. And so we should adapt what we do in schools to uh, re reflect those findings that we're getting from educational neuroscience. It's not a program. It's not going to go away. So the thing to do is to say, hey, this can be, this can be helpful. And you know what? If you follow what the findings of, of educational neuroscience, it makes teaching easier. Easier, that's it. Because yes. it shifts the burden of learning mm -hmm. to the student. And one of my Sousa expressions is, whoever explains learns. And if the teacher is doing all the explaining, as often happens in secondary school, they just tell you what they know because they have a cover curriculum, they're doing all the learning. And the students are sitting back thinking, when will this end? This too shall pass. So the neat thing about the neuroscience is that it shows us how to shift the learning to the, to the student's brain. So the students do, the stu whoever Whatever, another one of my expressions is, um, the brain that does the work is the brain that learns. And if the student, and if the teacher's brain is doing all the work, that's why they know their stuff so well. They keep learning it and learning it. But it's the student's brain that should be doing the work. So if you follow some of the recommendations from educational neuroscience, your job in the classroom becomes easier because it gives you strategies of how to shift the learning to the brain that should be doing it, which is the student's brain. That makes sense? Yes.